Good morning, First Baptist Church of Cedar Hill. Uh, this is the second Sunday of the Corona pandemic, which has uh, caused changes in our lives and in our church life and church family. So we are trying to step up, and what we're doing this morning is bringing a message to you uh, via YouTube and uh, recording it and setting it up for March the 22nd. We are going to continue in our series of 1 Peter, and so we will be in chapter 4 this morning. Do pray that you are surviving this well in faith, confidence, and uh, I have already heard from many. We're already longing for that day when we can be back together and in each other's presence and worshiping together, and that is a wonderful thing, a good byproduct of all this. Sometimes we take a lot for granted, and this will teach us not to. Before this morning, uh, go ahead, get that cup of coffee, get your Bible uh, or your phone, and turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 11. That is our text for the today. And our message title would be this, uh, kind of a two-way. And it is the rest of your time, could be the way we look at it, or making your life count for Christ. So follow with me as I begin reading with verse 1. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with this same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of of God. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lewdness, lusts, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In regard to these, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling, as each one has received a gift. Minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, uh, this is a different time, but Lord, through your Spirit we can be connected just as much as we were in the presence of one another, by your Spirit, by your Word, by your moving. Lord, refresh our souls this morning. Uh, cause an awareness in, a, in us. Put us in a spiritual tuning to you and your will, how you're speaking to us, what you want to do in our lives, even in these days. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the rest of your time, what was Peter getting at? Well, chapter 4 begins with the word, therefore. So Peter is building upon what he has said previously as we were coming to a conclusion in chapter 3. He's trying to lay a foundation to build his points upon coming into these verses we just read this morning. Peter is trying to fortify these Christians in his day to strengthen, to build them up, not only to just say to continue to believe, but the goal 
is for them to be living a life for Christ. We have that same goal. So, his building points are these from chapter 3. Number one is that Christ has suffered. His sacrifice on the cross is all sufficient to make us alive spiritually before God. That's a pretty important point to be bringing out. And then, of course, he brings out the resurrection. We don't know if we're going to be able to meet uh, for Easter or not. I, I'm still trying to be hopeful that we will. But that is the time we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord, obviously. But the resurrection, sometimes I think maybe like being in church, we've gotten used to. But the power and the glory of that resurrection, the first dead coming back to life, uh, preeminent with Peter in his faith and his thinking and his theology. But I want to bring out one other thing that he concluded with at the end of chapter 3. And I find it amazing. I don't hear a lot of preaching or teaching on it in our day and time. And it is the ascension of Christ from the Mount of Olives. So, in Peter's makeup, he is thinking, yes, the death of Christ, the burial of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, but he cannot disassociate the ascension of Christ. And why is that? Well, there's another thing that goes right with it. And that is, whenever the ascension is mentioned, the Lord was going away. He was ascending to the right hand of the Father, is what Scripture tells us. And we find that in Acts 2. But with that, he has ascended on the right hand and is waiting, is anxious to return and come and gather us to himself. Now, saying all of that, we're trying to build up to something. There is a power that comes with realizing these truths, and that is what Peter is building upon as he's going to give the next Christian living principles that we need to have a sound, secure, and really an evangelistic faith. Saying that, and mentioning the ascension, if, if I were to say to you, the Great Commission, I believe most anybody watching this this morning would say, oh, oh yeah, I, I know what that is, go and make disciples of all the world, teaching them to observe all things, so on and so forth. We know that. We know that. And yet, quite candidly and honestly, today we are so weak in that. We know it, but do we know it? And do we do it? What is that? Sharing our faith with Christ. You're not going to find any better time, possibly in your lifetime, than today. Most of us, too, would have gone through 9-11. That was a very fearful time in our country. I think this is probably uh, affecting people more, uh, certainly in number, than 9-11 did. Our witness. Why, why don't we have that power? You, you look at Peter. You look at the early church. I love in Acts when it says, these that have turned the world upside down for Christ. Seems like we're far from that today. And why is that? We'll look at a few things in a moment. But is it possible, just rethink things for a minute, that for this evangelistic pathos, this power that should be coming forth, that the powering or the fueling of it, uh, we don't have all of it. It should be, yes, the Lord. Yes, the resurrection. Yes, the promise of his return, but that comes off his ascension. Peter was there for everything that is being laid out. He saw it. He was a personal witness to it. But in Peter's life, in his remembrance and how he is stirred, being there on the Mount of Olives, watching the ascension of his Lord, who had just days previously said, Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? 
Peter, do you love me? And oh, how that groaned in, in, in Peter's soul. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Peter was there on that mountain when he watched the Lord ascended. Peter was there, saw the angels, he heard the voice. He was also there on the Mount of Transfiguration. He was also there during the time of the Lord's passion and trial. He was also there to receive the news that the Lord had risen and he ran running to the tomb. All of this. Now, I know you and I, we can't be there in person, but we can capture the spirit of it in our heart with the truth. See, is it quite possible that today we need this great truth, this great moment of the ascension, with that acknowledging it, that with it, the other end of that is the return of Christ. This is what pushed the early church. They believed in an imminent return of Christ. They needed to be busy. They needed to get it done. I was going to say this to the end, but I'll say it now. I wasn't going to say a lot about the corona. It's going to come up at the end in verse 7. When the Lord, or Peter was saying here, but the end of all things is near. I'm not going to say it is. I'm not going to say it isn't as far as immediate. When we talk about uh, the tribulation and things and all that line, I'm not going to discount that it could be. I'm not going to say that it is. But I'll guarantee you this thing right now is making a lot of people think as well it should. So what is he saying here in verse 1? He is saying, arm yourselves likewise. It's part of the power, a problem we don't have a power, is we don't have the right ammunition. We're not armed well. I know my mind might go to a few other areas about this thing of being armed, but certainly it can, it, let me ask you this, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Could it be your arming your home security system? Could it be your arming the theft system in your car? It could be that we are thinking of a uh, weapons application, a military weapon where it is armed and ready to go. A lot of this though, when you're armed, what is the concept? You're getting ready for an intrusion, something that could happen to kind of come into your space. Peter is saying for these Christians to be strong. Arm yourselves. Be ready. Be vigilant. Know what could happen. Be prepared. And in all of this, he is saying it spiritually. If I think of a pistol, if I think of a rifle, you are putting a live round, live round, in that chamber. And it is ready to be struck by that firing pin. And when that happens, there is an explosion of power that sends something out. Peter is saying, arm yourselves. With what? Well, he's saying the mind of Christ. And what is that? Well, again, that was coming off the back of chapter 3. And he's saying, be like Christ. Be willing. There might come times of suffering. Uh-oh. Can we correlate that to today there might be times of persecution but I want to go a step further we are our, our world is is turned uh, upside down a little bit right now because of world events because of things really when you get into this epistle Peter is talking about when difficulties come into your life strictly because of your faith and witness for Christ I'm sitting here today, the greatest thing I can tell you is the peace I have, the calm I have in knowing that I'm saved and knowing that the Lord's in control. And a lot of people today can't say that. But we're all going through this. But what, what is here? He's talking about, am I willing to suffer? Am I willing to sacrifice like Christ did for the sake of others? There's a big difference between that and going through a tornado, a drought, a pandemic, whatever might be happening. The lost and the saved both go through all of that. That, that. that doesn't clarify anything. But here he's speaking to Christians. He's speaking to 
you and me in this area of fortifying ourselves, having that mind of Christ. And if our Lord was willing to do it, one of the first things we ought to say is, Dear God, help me. How can I have less of a mind or not be willing to do that for Him? There's a couple of reasons. You're going to find, or I have found, or believe, that in life uh, there's two types of people. There's lost, there's saved. That's it. No in between. There's two types of Christians. There's the committed Christian and there's the carnal Christian. Two types. Why don't we see a lot of people being saved? Why don't we see a lot of commitment to the ministry of the churches? Because people who profess to have faith in Christ, who would say they believe and they truly may believe, but are in reality living a very carnal, secular life. We, we can all talk the talk, but as we have all seen in the past, it is, how do we walk? And Peter, again, is bringing that out here. See, a lot of us, and some of it can be, you can be a carnal Christian because you've never been discipled, you've never really gotten into the Word of God like you should, you don't have much of a prayer life, you're not around... A Christian company, maybe not involved in a church, and that's one of the great reasons to be in church is to be edified and encouraged by other Christians, shown the way, mentored, all of the words we want to use today, and they, they have a great purpose. But it may be that's not where you are, but you say, yes, I know the Lord. But we're caught up in many worldly activities. I cannot begin to name them all. And I, Peter, we're going to read a few, go back and do it, but it doesn't name them all. But we can get an idea. Listen again to what he's saying in verses 3 and 4. And he, I love the word, he, he uses the word we. We don't picture Peter in everything probably like we should. What exactly was his life before Jesus came by and said, follow me, and he answered the call? How did he live? We don't know. We can imagine. But notice what he says. When we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. That's just some. That would actually be a whole other study. But in reality, just saying a few, lewdness can be referred to, and if you want to take uh, the Webster's Dictionary and look it up, it can mean obscene or vulgar, Another translation has lasciviousness, which is just really general loose living. So we can begin to get an idea of acts or events that are evil or wicked. It also carries the connotation of lusts. And a lot of times our first thought in that is we think of the physical and the sexual. Well, that, that is true. But there can be uh, far more than that. It is really all kind of cravings is what this is referring to in the Greek language. Uh, lust, what do we think? Satan has a three-pronged attack in this realm of lusts. I've often said if you had three cups, you could put them out there, and every single sin, every single trap that Satan is going to try to get us in will fall, all of them, into one of these three cups. And that could be the lust of the eyes, the lust of of the flesh and the pride of life. Every single sin, every temptation, every trap falls into one of those three categories. Satan's three-pronged attack on my soul and your soul and every individual's soul. Well, Paul is trying to get, or Peter, or Peter is to, uh, commitment. How, why can there be a difference in that carnal and spiritual Christian? It is the area of commitment. Real love for Christ, real commitment, and true discipleship is when we come to a place and point, after we're saved, that we love our Lord more than any of these other things. They might have a strong pull or attachment to us. But we love the Lord so much. We regard, we worship Him. His worth to us is so much. 
we're willing to cut ties if we find that these things are hindering my living for the Lord or my closeness to Him. Peter said something in here that throws a lot of people. And he said this, For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Oh man, does that mean all of a sudden I've made and you have made sinless perfection? That's never going to happen. And the Apostle Paul said, I have not attained. And, and that's true. As long as we're in this world, in this flesh, uh, we will sin. But hopefully, we're not sinless, but we sin less and less and less. Uh, as we get closer to Christ, we find that that ought to be what takes place. But what he is saying here is the person with this great love for Christ above anything else in the world, that that love so draws them to Christ, they're pulling him, uh, he's pulling them away from these other areas of the world and the pull of the world, if you were to think of it in gravitational terms. In other words, there's a, a breaking free. Another area of this flat out that he says is, when you have gotten to a place in your Christian life, when you've gone through a time of persecution, when people have looked down, belittled, you have felt small, maybe it is outright persecution that you have suffered for Christ, that is when you have really broken free of the gravitational pull of this world. That is when you have broken free from the pull of of Satan and sin and these other areas that can so throttle, so beset our attempt to live for the Lord. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. And I haven't always looked at it this way. We don't look at persecution as a good thing. But it's a powerful thing. It's powerful. And by the way, that was the mind of Christ. That was how we are. In other words, what should I do in this world? If I'm the type that's going to go through and think, oh, uh, everything just ought to be grand. I know God loves me. He wants me to be a, a millionaire. He wants me to live a certain lifestyle of the rich and famous. And I just go to, I should have no difficulty. Nothing should happen in my family or those I love and everything. You're going to be sadly disappointed because Christ himself suffered. Christ was willing to sacrifice it would be a whole other message. But think of what he altered in his life, his body of divinity, to come here and rescue you and me and show the way. He gave it all up. And we think, hey, I'm supposed to be a millionaire because I'm a Christian. I'm afraid that's pretty shallow Christian living. And it's not really going to be one that finds much power or fulfillment in it. But it's a lot of what we see out there today. But it's also another reason why people say, well, I just found the Christian life didn't work. You never found it, friend. You need to go deeper. What's another thing we need? Well, he mentioned in here about the will of God. Ooh, boy, that's a deep one. But I can give you some general things, and we're just going to touch on it. But in other words, if I'm armed with the mind of Christ and I'm seeking the will of God for my life, that's going to make a difference. That's going to be a fortifying factor in how I live my life. I can say this about the will of God. There's some general things for everybody about God's will. Number one, God's will for you, for me, for everybody is that we first be saved. That we find Him as our Lord and Savior. That's for all. That's a, that's a general will of God. Christ Himself said, I've come to seek and to save that which was lost. He wants everyone to be saved. But secondly, in this area of God's will, you will find as well that He wants our lives to be transformed. He wants there to be a change. He wants there to be a drawing unto Him, a separated life dedicated to Him. So, God wants us to be saved. He wants us to be separated unto Him. A third one we'll find is that God's will is that we find our gifts 
What is that? I have abilities, you have abilities. You have some I don't have. Maybe I have some you don't have. But we use those gifts to enhance Christians, the body of Christ in witness, and in that to build the church, but to glorify Christ with the gifts that, yes, He has given as well. But you know, a lot of Christians never find this. When you get to talking in this area about gifts, they go, well, I don't know what my gifts are. Well, that's a way to live your Christian life, pursuing, trying to find those gifts, and then utilizing them for the Lord, glorifying Him. And the fourth would be this, it comes to you, to me. And again, this is the area where we find God's perfect will for our own individual life. For mine, it was a call to the ministry. For yours, maybe it's that. Maybe it will be something else. But see, I can't tell you that. You have to find it. That's part of living your Christian life pursuit. And the glory of it is, and the peace, and when you find it fulfilling, is when you find God's will for your life and then live it. That is when it is all real. That is when there is the power and the pathos. Peter had to find it. Paul had to find it. The disciples had to find it. Christians down through the centuries. God has tailored that perfect will for you, just for you, out of His love for you. And I would say, you pray. You might ask some others, what are, what are gifts you see in me that I might have? It's interesting that sometimes others see in us things we never see. And sometimes when they tell us that, we go, really? But all of this helps you live that dedicated life to Christ. And one that is powerful. And one that influences others for Christ. In salvation, in living, in being a testimony. All of that takes place. So why should I alter my life for any of this? A lot of folks might ask that question. Is it worth it? I have other pursuits. There's things that I want to do. I might be worried about what others might say about me. Oh, well, that's true. Well, let me ask you this. Do you claim to be saved? Do you claim to be a Christian? That's one reason we try to find it. Another would be, would you claim or say, well, I love the Lord. Do you really? Then find it. Pursue it. How will you live your life? How will you live the rest of your life? How will you live the rest of your life from these days of COVID-19 pandemic and forward to the end of your days? or the Lord returns as well to experience a real walk with Christ. I think many people, their world has been shaken. God's going to use this. He's in control. Sometimes we have that wicked, false illusion that I'm in control of my life. And that is a lie. I know as I've gotten older, I don't mind it. I actually find a peace in it. The older I get, the more I realize, the less I'm in control. And that's okay, because the Lord is in control. But a lot of people's lives are shaken. Yes, verse 7 said this, But the end of all things, is at hand. That's another reason I might start thinking along how am I going to live my life? How am I going to make it count? Peter said this over 2,000 years ago. He said, then, how much closer are to we now? Prophecy is an interesting thing. Don't want to go one area where you go overboard. You don't want to go the other where you just don't pay any attention to it like many do. Many Christians do. Maybe they're starting to rethink things today. But it ought to make us think about how we're living. Uh, the end of all things is at hand. 
I look at prophecy kind of like a football game where you have the first quarter, second quarter, halftime, third quarter, fourth quarter, and in the fourth quarter you have the two minutes at the end. Personally, I believe we're probably somewhere right around that area. But it's getting closer and closer. That's another reason that we ought to consider how is my life being lived? How does the Lord look at my life? What does He think? All of this. Making our lives count. Making them count for the Lord. Making them count for others. Christians should have a peace and a calm in these days that the others don't have. I hope we can portray that. The world needs it right now. A calm. But it comes in our faith in Christ. In our salvation. In His sovereignty. That He's in control. This morning, as we have spent this time together, let that build your life, your faith. And be building up again to where we can be together. We're going to do it with a lot more heart felt instead of ritual and going through the motions, it's going to be real. Because if anything, this is teaching us too, we don't know what's going to be right around the corner. I cannot believe now that this is the only time we're going to face something like this. I think our time has altered. And maybe it's time to alter how we have been living for Christ and how we need to be living for Christ. Well, this is the first time we have completely recorded a message for Sunday morning. We've been streaming. Uh, we've been recording services previously from the auditorium, but this is it, and it, it might be this format uh, for the next few weeks. We are planning on doing things uh, Sunday school-wise, doing some uh, videoing just like this for our Sunday school hour, the various teachers. We are probably going to be in the days ahead next week doing very short, two, three devotional type segments, thoughts on what's going on from our Christian perspective to you for our church family. So I pray this has been a blessing. Uh, we certainly would like to hear from you one way or the other and how we can improve and get going. But we're not stopping. The church is going to go forward in these days and times, and First Baptist Church is going to be going forward. Communicate with one another. Uh, that can be texting, that can be social media, but you know what? It wouldn't hurt. I think today we're going to get to a place where we just want to hear voices too. Maybe use the phone for phone calls and call somebody. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we're going to worship you today. You're still the same God. You are the God of yesterday, today, and forever. And Lord, nothing has caught you by surprise. These are interesting days. Again, I say exciting days. Help us to rethink how we can live for you and minister to others with what we have today. Bless our church family. Protect our church family. Help us, maybe in our own homes and our marriages, to share our faith more than what we have. A lot of times we just depend on outside sources to do things. Well, we're internal. I know at this moment we have a restriction. They might get tighter before we find them becoming more loose. But Lord, help us to be doing your work. Help us to be ministering. Help the Word to be going out in power and reaching souls for you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.